Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last time, Longstreet helped defeat John Pope's Army of Virginia at the Second Battle of Manassas. With that, the Army of Northern Virginia would invade the North for the first time. The situation called for action, and there was but one opening across the Potomac, Longstreet stated. To relieve the Virginia landscape from the ravages of war, Robert E. Lee and his commanders agreed that the time was ripe for an invasion. The army wasted no time in their movement. Longstreet began his march to Leesburg and began crossing the Potomac River. His troops would reach Frederick, Maryland on September 7th. Many citizens along the way welcomed the Confederates with cheers and offers of food. Lee, concerned about the rear of the army, wanted at least a portion of the army to return to Harper's Ferry and capture that garrison. But Longstreet advised against it, stating that it would be unwise to divide the army with the threat of Union forces so close at hand. The next day, Longstreet came to Lee's headquarters and met with Jackson and the army commander. The three men must have been a sight to see. Lee had his hands in splints because of a fall. Longstreet was stricken with a chafed heel and couldn't wear his boot on that foot, so he wore a carpet slipper. And Jackson had been thrown by his horse and was in obvious pain from the fall. The three men discussed Lee's plan to capture Harper's Ferry and it was decided to divide the army. Longstreet suggested for the entire army to be used in the capture of the garrison, but Lee decided against it. But Lee did acquiesce to Longstreet offering more troops from his command to support Jackson in the capture. The entire Army of Northern Virginia moved to the west to use the mountains to protect them if the Union Army moved against their divided forces. Then Jackson moved with his command to Harper's Ferry, leaving Longstreet at Boonesboro. However, it didn't take long for Union forces to move on their position. Word came that a large federal force was coming from the north via Hagerstown, and Lee dispatched Longstreet toward that town on September 11th. Lee accompanied Longstreet as they traveled. Longstreet got more worried and irritated at the further separation of the army. He turned to Lee and said, General, I wish we could stand still and let the Yankees come to us. The march was grueling. Some men had forced marched many miles since leaving Richmond, and straggling became rampant. It was estimated that a quarter of the army was falling away as it marched north. To further add to the struggle, the citizens of this section of Maryland were less friendly to the Confederacy. Southern soldiers who ventured onto farms looking for food found insults thrown at them and shut doors. At Hagerstown, Longstreet's command got a little rest as they stayed there from the 12th to the 13th. However, the situation changed when Stuart informed Lee that the Union Army was moving across the Catoctin Mountains and would be pushing towards South Mountain very soon. Lee's divided force could be defeated in detail if he did not delay McClellan's army. Longstreet met with Lee and they discussed the new information. Longstreet suggested that his command pull back to Sharpsburg, Maryland and set up defensive positions. That way, both halves of the army would be closer together and if McClellan attacked Jackson, he could hit the Union Army in the flank and rear. But Lee waved off that idea and decided to make a stand at South Mountain. Longstreet defended Turner's Gap, Fox's Gap, and Crampton's Gap. D.H. Hill's men fought tooth and nail against Union troops at Turner's Gap, but got mauled in the process. Longstreet examined the field and wrote Lee a note stating that they could not hold their position unless reinforced, so Lee agreed for the troops to fall back during the night. They would fall back to the small town of Sharpsburg, Maryland, where Lee placed his troops over the hills surrounding the community along the Antietam Creek. Longstreet's troops would arrive on the 15th, on the same day, Jackson sent word that Harper's Ferry had been captured. Lee believed that the slow-moving McClellan would not attack until the 17th, giving the Confederates one whole day to concentrate their troops. Longstreet made his headquarters at the farmhouse of Henry and Elizabeth Piper, about 500 yards south of the sunken road. The family made dinner for him and D.H. Hill, whose headquarters were also on the property. The family offered the gentlemen wine with their meal, but Longstreet declined, thinking it may be poisoned. But after D.H. Hill drank a glass and remained unfazed, Longstreet asked for a glass. The generals and their staff would sleep in the Piper's Orchard that night. On the morning of September 16th, Longstreet ate breakfast with the Piper's and then looked over the positions of his troops with Lee. McClellan's army moved into position to attack on the 17th, just as Lee had predicted. On the morning of September 17th, the Battle of Antietam erupted on the hills surrounding the town of Sharpsburg. The beginning of the battle revolved around Miller's cornfield, the woods that flanked the field, and the Dunker Church. Longstreet supervised his troops on the right and then joined Lee and D.H. Hill at the sunken road. As they looked over the troops, Longstreet and Lee on foot and Hill on horseback, 
Longstreet said to Hill, If you insist on riding up there and drawing the fire, give us a little interval so that we may not be in line of fire when they open on you. Just a few moments later, a cannon belched forth its projectile. Longstreet said to Hill, That one was meant for you. A second later, the projectile took off the forelimbs of Hill's horse. Although a horrific sight, Longstreet found a little comedy in the situation when Hill was puzzled about how to get off the panicked animal. Longstreet responded, This side, Hill. No, the other. Get off over his head. Hill, slide off behind. Once Hill got off the animal, the horse was put down. A member of Hill's staff remembered that under fire, Longstreet was cool and calm as if he was on dress parade. The only external indication of worry was that he seemed to bite clean through his tobacco at every chew of the cigar. From the Piper farm, Longstreet watched all over the battlefield, but paid close attention to the fighting happening at the sunken road, soon to be called Bloody Lane. He called up Richard Anderson's division to support Hill, but Anderson went down with a wound quickly, giving command to Roger Pryor. When artillery began to fall thick amongst his men, Pryor requested artillery support from Longstreet. Longstreet replied with a note reading, I am sending you the guns, my dear general. This is a hard fight, and we had all better die than lose it. When a regiment mistakenly withdrew from the road, this resulted in the rest of the regiments and brigades pulling back as well, allowing the Union troops to breach the Confederate line. Miller's battery of the Washington artillery was sent by Longstreet to help stop the breakthrough, but Union artillery wounded many men of the gun crew, so Longstreet's staff, including Moxley Sorrell, Tom Gorey, Tom Walton, John Fairfax, and Peyton Manning, began loading the guns and pulling the lanyard to fire into the approaching blue troops. Longstreet perched atop his horse, holding the reins of his aide's horses, chewed on a cigar, and ordered canister to be loaded into the gun. A concentration of artillery fire from around the battlefield stalled the Union breakthrough and sent the blue troops backward. Although Longstreet got accolades for his performance at the sunken road, Longstreet, in a letter after the war, insisted that D.H. Hill was the hero of the day. He wrote, had the fight made by D.H. Hill been made by a Virginian, it would have been heralded as a wonderful achievement and to all time, but Hill was from far down in Dixie. On the Confederate route, Ambrose Burnside's Union Corps moved across Antietam Creek and was only stopped by A.P. Hill's Light Division that barely arrived in time to stop the Union assault. The Battle of Antietam ended as the bloodiest single day in American history with over 23,000 casualties. Longstreet's staff was hit hard while manning the guns in the Piper Orchard. Walton was hit by a bullet in the shoulder, Sorrel was knocked unconscious and bruised by the concussion of a shell burst, and John Fairfax lost his prized gray stallion named Saltron. Distraught, Fairfax rushed to Longstreet and said, General, General, my horse is killed. Saltron is shot. Shot right in the back. Longstreet turned to his aide and gave him a weird look and stated, Never mind, Major. You ought to be glad you are not shot in your own back. Lee wanted to stay on the field that night. He gathered his commanders together at his headquarters. Generals Jackson, D.H. Hill, A.P. Hill, Hood, Jubal Early, and David R. Jones attended. When Lee saw that General Longstreet had not joined them, he got terribly worried. He asked the others if they had seen the general. Longstreet then rode into headquarters smoking a cigar. An artillery shell had caught a house on fire in Sharpsburg, and he was helping the family put it out. Relieved at the sight of Longstreet, Lee walked up to him and grasped his subordinate's hand and said, Ah, here is Longstreet. Here is my old war horse. Let us hear what he has to say. The two men talked together for a time, and then each division commander was given orders to cook rations for their soldiers at the front. They would stay the night and see what tomorrow brought. 